All right. Hello, hello, hello. How are you today? I'm doing pretty good. In a good mood. Ready to do some track feedback here. Got my thumbs up happening. Uh, yeah, if you're not following the channel yet, please make sure to follow the channel and click the little bell so you can get notified when we do more uh, live streams like this. I'm trying to do more of these live events. The response to the last two has been awesome. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to do more of these live events. And uh, I think track feedback is a really fun way to give back to uh, all of you awesome people. So, uh, yeah, please subscribe to the channel. You know, engage with the posts and stuff so that we pop up on your, uh, your algorithm. Because, you know, the algorithm will uh, just serve you garbage, hot garbage. If you uh, if you don't engage, because um, you know, a lot of the uh, there's a lot of people out there who are just beating that dead horse all day. Like subscribe, like subscribe. And they're they're just better at doing that than me, so their videos come up first. So yeah, if you want uh, if you want to see more from the channel, please like subscribe, click the little bell. Um, I am now managing the channel myself as well as the discord myself trying to get uh, a little bit more hands-on and be less aloof in the community so um yeah if you have comments or suggestions or anything it is actually me reading them now so yeah that's cool not that uh, you know my team aren't great but uh i just figured you know i should get in there a bit more and uh get my ear to the ground and connect with the peeps and all that good stuff. Um, all right. So today we are doing track feedback. There were quite a few suggestions. Um, so I'm going to try to be quick yet thorough. So uh, up first, we've got uh, the, the aliens somewhere flip of she's like, and this is, uh, this is from cam. Oh, <laughs> Okay, let's make sure that the levels are good. Check, check, check. Yeah, those levels are good. Yo, yo. All right. Cool intro.
Okay, cool. So I probably should have downloaded that um, right away so that you could hear it. But I just want to draw your attention to a couple things. Um, so first off, there's this kind of like really full on uh, aliasing, like digital artifact kind of noise happening in the highs, especially up in the right side. Um, and there's a test that I really like to do, which is to isolate what I call the three extremes and listen through uh just to those so the three extremes are the extreme highs above about eight thousand right that's the the one extreme the extreme lows which are below about uh 80 hertz right that's the sub bass right so i'll play through just each of these kind of on their own and then i'll also um, isolate just the sides and that's like the third extreme so if I put this into mid side mode by right clicking then I can change the balance over all the way to the sides and some people like to make a rack that you know will have the power buttons so that's like you know uh, highs only and then this one would be lows only or sub only really and then this one would be sides only. Um, and, you know, once you're kind of used to listening for this, you won't have to go through and like make this rack. But this rack, you know, if you've uh, if you've not trained your ear to listen for the three extremes, this rack is a good way to do it. But uh, when you listen to that highs, right? Right. You see how there's that like steady tone. Yeah, it's like this weird kind of tone up here that's like kind of like a e like really really high. That's like um aliasing from whatever um sample you saw. You probably sampled that off of like an MP3 or something. Uh but you can really hear that like any kind of whenever you're sampling something that's like of questionable quality any kind of compression or ott or saturation or whatever is going to really bring that out so there's this like really pronounced kind of artificial sounding ringing up here uh what is that it's about like yeah it's like really really high up in the frequency spectrum but it's kind of um uh not not pleasant right so be aware of that and then also i would recommend giving a playthrough of just the sides because there's all kinds of like actually this kind of sometimes if you want to if you want to see the spectrum after doing the sides only because it usually won't let you do that um then you gotta force it to mono and then you'll see the spectrum again um oh wait uh where is it yeah flip yeah, flip the face, there we go. But you can see there's a lot of like lows in the sides that you probably don't need. Um, and the sides are just kind of like everything has sides. They're not really like structured, you know? So I like to have a lot of really intentional structure in the three extremes because that's really how, you've, how, you, um, f how you mix, you know? There's like uh, basically five dimensions to the mix. There's the three extremes, extreme highs above 8K, extreme lows below uh, 80, and then the sides only. And then there's um, what I like to call the pain zone, which is that area of the Fletcher Munson curve that is uh, uh, the Fletcher, yeah, Fletcher Munson curve here. This is, this is like a, a curve of equal loudness. So this way down here feels like the same volume as this. So this at like, you know, any audio at all in this range between about 2K and 6K, uh, but any audio, any range, anything audio at all is going to be about as noticeable as like 70 dB of, um, of uh, like, 
you know, 20 hertz. So that's crazy, right? Like this dip in the Fletcher Munson curve, your ear is a lot more sensitive here. And then a lot of people kind of don't notice this, but there's another dip up at the top where your ear gets more and more sensitive until you can't hear. So anything above about 11K, that's kind of like framing the mix. And that's like, you know, how you define front and back in the mix is largely determined by the pain zone, activity in the pain zone, where this your ear is more sensitive, like your ear wants frequencies, wants these frequencies, so you're listening harder for these frequencies, right? This is where a lot of the definition of speech and stuff is. So your ear is listening harder here, and then it's listening harder way up at the top. And um, having all these extra highs, especially like weird random aliasing and stuff up here, it's like super noticeable. You're probably not noticing it because you've worked on this track for a long time, but a uh, casual listener is going to notice those highs a lot and um, they're not really necessary. So what I would recommend doing is like if you kind of um, go in here and uh, EQ out all of those highs that you don't need. Like, like definitely play through and listen to the three extremes as you play through. But um, if you take out the highs, or I'm going to close this rack because we don't really need it. If you take out the highs above about here. Until that ringing goes away and then you can put like a little bit of a boost back then if you hit that with a little bit of saturator after any eq like that like let's put it on analog and then high quality right and then you you so you make it so that the whole instrumental doesn't have those highs and then just the sound that you want in front just give that sound and that sound only the full frequency range so i'll do that a lot like if i'm making um, a rap song for example and i want the vocal to be in front i'll make sure that you know the instrumental has there's like a little scoop out of the instrumental here in the pain zone so the instrumental's not like blowing it up too hard and then i'll roll off like all the highs like above basically 10k because like when you roll something off here right this curve is not like a vertical brick wall like and even this is kind of a lie like stuff stuff gets through on the other side of the filter right but i would i would say figure out where those like ringing highs are coming from get rid of them and then probably like low pass basically everything just a little like up in the extreme psychoacoustic highs range and then have just the main sound um get the highs and the pain zone and then you know if the main sound has highs and pain zone but the rest of the instrumental doesn't then that main sound is going to sit up in front and feel really 3d and be super big um rather than having like everything kind of mashing in these highs um because that's like like a lot of the time that's a big uh issue with people's mixes is they have unstructured highs especially um you know transients and sides in the highs are really tough um but yeah so the three extremes the pain zone and then transients because transients are like that first flick of sound and uh transients are very very um noticeable transients are very very noticeable um okay so now uh another thing that you're missing is sub right and if you just take uh operator it does a great sub and then I'm going to put this on. Yeah, but if you have like a little bit of
But yeah, just like a little bit of sub down there will make a big difference. Um, and then if you want the sub to be a little bit more noticeable, um, you can try putting a little bit of shaper. Sign shaper works really well on sub, you know, but you don't. Yeah. Yeah, those probably those notes. Yeah, but yeah, so figure out what those those bass notes are and just get some sub down there because there's not really any sub happening in the whole song. Um, and then I would recommend, um, you know, getting a low pass filter and doing some kind of strategic low pass filter buildups. Uh, Cause like, let's say you're coming into a transition, right? Right? So let's say, um, what BPM is this? Um, oh, it's 100. It says very conveniently on the file. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, so. So you see here, if you do like, um, you know, one of these. Right, like that. Give it one of those uh, quick kind of classic sort of edits. And then if you do like a nice little low pass filter build up here like this, right? Right? Those kinds of things, like on the master or on like the whole melody group or whatever, just this nice, simple, low pass build up transitions, they'll give your ear a break from the constantness of the highs and the constantness of the, um, the constantness of all the sounds and then make your drops feel fresh again, even if you've been listening to those sounds a lot. But yeah, I would say definitely like low pass uh, filter. And I'm not using any particular settings with the, um, EQ and saturator here. I was just taking the very, very highs above 10k out. Um, but I would, I would do that on everything except for the instrumental, or for the main instrument. So like the, the, the acoustic guitar and the vocal. I would not do this too. But, um, but yeah, getting, getting the highs that you don't need, like getting them out of the way, so that just the main focus sound can have the um uh, the very highs above above this because like your ear hears this like you're more sensitive here and here right so if you make sure that the instrumental doesn't have um like you know 11k 12k 13k like those are extremely high frequencies and if you if you're noticing that the high frequencies are missing when you low pass if you add a little resonance to the low pass that boost around the cutoff will make it feel like because this is still highs here at like you know 7 8k that's still highs it's just not the air above 10k right so that little bit of resonance there will boost the highs around the cutoff and then above the cutoff it goes away but that's usually how i'm like defining front and back is with those five dimensions you know the extreme highs extreme lows side only signals transients and pain zone and you want to make sure that your front sound that is in the front of the mix is taking advantage of those five things as much as possible and that it's not being dominated by any one of those five things in another sound um okay so next up uh, we got Adam Knox. Who I'm going to go follow on SoundCloud at uh, Adam Knox IN. And this is Close Eyes. Now, close your eyes. Oh, nice telephone filter on that vocal. Very cool. This is cool. Now, 
Bit of a lopsided stereo image there. Okay, so same thing here. Drops drops are all about contrast, right? They're all about like um the way I like to explain it is like a drop should feel like a birthday present, you know? Like you know you're gonna get something for your birthday. You know it's gonna be cool, but it's wrapped up for a reason, you know? You build the suspense and then it should be like a welcome surprise, you know? Um, so when I'm going into drops a lot of the time, I'll use this rack that I call the drop rack, very easy to make. You can do this in any DAW. But what this rack is doing is very slowly, like during a breakdown, I will like creep down the whole thing right really really slowly like imperceptibly slowly and it's taking away a couple db off of the master a couple db out of the highs a couple db out of the lows and then it's making the stereo image more narrow and then when it opens it's like a surprise right so like you don't really hear that going down And then you can make anything drop, right? Because it's that sudden opening up. So I'd say if you want to make your drops feel more droppy, um, you know, don't use your main kick in your before the drop. Don't use your main snare before the drop. Don't give us full wide sides right before the drop. Don't give us full force highs right right before the drop. And don't give us full, full force lows right before the drop. So all those dimensions that I just mentioned before, the three extremes, the pain zone and transients, you want to like slowly decrease all of those so that on the moment of the drop, it can open up and feel like suddenly there's highs, suddenly there's transients, suddenly there's bass, suddenly there's sides, suddenly there's a clear thing happening in the pain zone you know and then that will um that will kind of help you from having transitions like this one right it's like right because it's like we've heard all those sounds right before that drop. Like we've been getting used to those sounds already. So when the drop comes in, it sounds like more of the same rather than a drop, right? You're also kind of changing up your main drum sequence a bit unnecessarily. Like the main steady kick and snare, um, it's kind of like just a little bit indulgent to change that pattern a lot. It's disrupting the, the, the dancers. And unless you have like a really good like reason to do that, it's kind of just like, I don't know, it just feels like you're like, oh, I want to change stuff because i need to flex you know so like don't don't change your main big kick and snare pattern unless you're like really certain that it needs changing because those changes they're not really driving the composition they're just kind of there for the sake of having some changes whereas if you have those changes in like you know if you devoted those changes to articulating your main lead or to um creating variation in the supplemental percussion you can still have that feeling of change without making the track hard to dance to for no reason. You know what I'm saying? Close your eyes. 
Really cool vocal with the um, telephone filter. That's awesome. And like this twinkly shit is really nice. That's a better drop. Yeah, that second drop, the composition and everything in that second drop is a lot better. Um, the way it's delivered is a lot better. You're still kind of wearing that main bass out a little bit um, before the drop, but um, the sequencing is a lot better. Those little stalls help a lot more, et cetera. Um, but yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool. Nice work, Adam. Um, all right. So now we've got the bad table. I think that's where I ate lunch at when, I, when I was in high school. I like this. This is a vibe. Bass in there. Woo! Very cool. Um, I really like uh, all the, the change-ups and the sequencing and stuff. Uh, that shit's all really cool. Um, you're kind of wearing that main kick out a little bit. Um, it also sounds a bit weird in the intro because like the kick in your drop here is the exact same kick as this. Right? Um, changing the actual like drum sounds as you go from sex section to section in the song is usually a really good idea because your ear becomes habituated to the same sound over and over again and um it just is it starts to get a little stale as a listener and then also um you know what level a kick is and what eq settings it should have and stuff are not gonna be like one level for the whole song like that same kick which the level is fine in this section that level is way too much in the beginning right like that's the exact same kick at the exact same level as this right so keep that in mind um, I'm also a big fan of like high passing the kick for intros. Like you don't necessarily need that sub, right? Cause a DJ, if a DJ is playing this, they're not going to be like, they're probably going to be taking the bass out while they're mixing anyway. 
and um you know using that uh eq8 midnight preset is like such a good preset um or eq3 uh but this midnight preset in the eq3 is amazing it just makes everything sound like lo-fi like check it out And like sometimes I'll have that on my master for the whole intro and then open it at the drop and you're like, oh, so I think that may be a little bit more helpful for you because like this full on kick at the at the beginning, it's a bit too much. Um, you may want to experiment with stem roller, which I linked in the chat there. It's a really amazing open source, uh, AI that you can use to split your samples out, um, cause there's a bit of like the vocal in the sample here it's like the noise of the sample like hitting whatever compression that you're hitting with the vocal in it is kind of like flattening it a bit and making it a bit mushy and kind of like you know you're like i can tell you want to like get more out of that sample but because you're compressing the vocal with everything else it's like bringing up all that low level noise that's in the sample you may have an easier time if you stem it first and then um you know maybe if you line them up perfectly you can have that compressed sound for the instrumental and then more of the vocal but yeah, anyway it's it's worth breaking that stem out and just seeing seeing if modif or working with the vocal by itself um, is a good idea. And then I would say like vary your actual drum sounds as you go from section to section. And, um, you know, perhaps even just like full on like midnight EQ3 preset for the whole, the whole beginning until you open it up. Um, Cause it kind of feels like Like it kind of feels like that's like a drop without bass or something. Like it's just, it doesn't like, it's kind of, it's unclear where you stand compositionally in that section, the intro and that ambiguity will make it more difficult if you're trying to DJ this. So having it be like pretty decisive difference between the early portion of the sound and the drop or the early portion of the song and the drop will probably really help. All right. So fly surgic. Whoa. Nice loud mix. Woo! Okay, well, I love how loud and clear you've got this mix. Um, the sides and the um, highs on your synth are just devouring that vocal. And this is the exact same thing that I was talking about with the first person who was up, Cam, where, you know, it's really hard to create a sense of front and back when what's in the back has super wide, dry highs and is like just blasting loud. Like this is just completely eating that vocal. <laughs> and then the panning like because the things that are the most noticeable are the three extremes the transients and the pain zone so having panning happening in something that is super blasted and full full frequency up and down and wide and it's moving it's like so noticeable that you just can't you there's no way you can get make it through that to the vocal yeah, you also got a, like way too many sounds at once here. Like, ask, what is the lead? Is it the affected, like, raw, raw time stretch vocal? Is it the rap that has different lyrics that's happening on top of that vocal? Or is it the loudest and most noticeable thing in the song, which is the super blasted wide dry highs on that synth sound that are pretty static and not really changing much? What am I supposed to listen to? <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, and then your drop is like quieter than your intro because of how blasted that intro is. Okay, so I want to show you some stuff too. Um, you're not really giving our ears a break from just like blasting us with those um, highs and everything being super clipped and stuff. And when when things are like super, like everything is just max, 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 like it's kind of like the mix is like pressing up against a glass window and like mushing its face into it. And there's a point where you get desensitized to it. Like loud is no longer loud. Wide is no longer wide. You know, crazy is no longer crazy. Like you just, it, your ears get overwhelmed and, and, uh, doing some, like, if you get some, make some one knob, one knobs, like if you have like a low, one knob, low pass, one knob, high pass, right? And then um, if you do uh, get auto pan flicker, right? Like those kinds of things will really, um, really help. Um, let's see, this one would be good. One knob, auto pan. Yeah, that will really help. Um, and then, so, okay, so, sounds like 70. Let's see, is it 70? Maybe 70 or 80. Four. Yeah, let's try 80. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so then, if you have some spots, yeah, because see how there's all these like highs and stuff happening in here that you don't necessarily need, right? Uh, and if you give your ear a break by making these little fills like... And then you can do like a couple edits. Like I will often edit the master of my track and do like, you know, little glitch edits like that. And then, you know, maybe a high pass here. And then maybe, you know, some auto pan stereo. Right. And those little edits, those little momentary edits, you can just do them with one knobs on your master, like little one knob racks. Um, I'm also a big fan. I made this like 16 one knobs rack. That's like 16 of my favorite one knobs. And then, you know, I always have these like one knobs, like all my best ones are available. And then, you know, just draw a ramp here. Right. And just have, just give it a break from the highs, give it a break from the lows, give it a break from the sides, you know, have some reverb freezes. Right, and then same thing here, like this channel EQ is just gonna take away the highs. So it's acting like a drop rack or like maybe some little record stops here and there.
right? But just those little little variations, um, you know, those little having those little variations like here and there as you go as the track plays, they give you a break from the highs, give you a break from the sides, give you a break from the transients, give you a break from everything else, and then it makes it feel like it's like dropping again at the end of each of those effects. <laughs> Another really good edit to know about is when you do a cut and you put it on no warp and then up two octaves and a reverse. Right, and then you get. Right, and you get these. Right, that sounds really good on melodies because it'll double time it when you uh, do the edit. But yeah, I'd say like give people's ears a break or else that like constant maximization is just going to be grating. And like, I don't know, it's just like, it's it tracks that are like super blasted like that where it's like loudness for its own sake, width for its own sake, you know, um, that doesn't age well usually, so... Um, I'd say, you know, get, make it more dynamic, um, by having little breaks and little spots where you like, cause you're doing that a bit, but it's like the whole thing is so pushed that you're never really taking away the sides fully or the highs fully or the lows fully, you know, there's always like, there's always a bit left and that bit that's left is being pushed. So you're kind of losing it, losing the impact of those, of that loudness and everything. All right. Oh, nice. We got some D&B from Misadventure. I like it. For drum and bass, you really don't need like long, boomy kicks and snares. I think when you when you do a bootleg like this of a song that's like a huge pop hit, you got to ask like who's this for? You know? Like um and what is the purpose of this track? Right? And like usually when you're remixing a song that's like a big famous song that everybody knows, you're basically reaching out to that fan base, you know? And you're saying like, "Hey, here's a new version of something that you already like. I hope you enjoy it. Become my fan, you know? 
And so it's important to be sensitive to the, like, if those people want to sing along to this track, if the vocals are all happening, like, in different spots and there's not a really clear musical reason to change the timing of them, it's just going to frustrate people who are trying to sing along, right? And when you're working with an acapella, uh, it's always a good idea to go check how that acapella lines up with the metronome in the original song because good vocalists don't land directly on the downbeat usually. You know, they're going to um, move their raps or their singing so that it doesn't happen on the same spots in the bar that the kick is happening and the snare is happening exactly. They'll usually adjust their timing very slightly to go around the beats so that, um, you know, it won't, um, it's almost like side chaining, but they're basically ducking their vocal by making it not on the downbeat so when you're warping an acapella the tendency is to be like oh that's the biggest spike in volume that must be the downbeat put a warp marker there and then put that on the downbeat but usually the actual singer for a song if it's a big pop hit have put a lot of time and energy and thought and practice and skill into not being on the downbeat right so I would say, you know, unless you're going to like, like if you're going to do a build up or something where it's like, don't speak, 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 you know, like, yeah, change the timing. But if you want people to actually sing along with like the chorus of a huge pop hit, it's usually a good idea to kind of preserve the original timing of that song, unless what you're doing with it is so innovative that people are going to be like, oh, well, of course they changed the timing. I mean, that's brilliant. But if you're not going to do something that's like a dramatic improvement, stick with what's working about the original, right? Because you want to basically take what works about the original and then build on top of it without undermining what's wor what's already working. And a lot of the time when you, um, you know, warp vocals and put them right on the downbeat or change the timing of a pop hit, um, it's just going to make it so that the people who like the original song are like offended, <laughs> you know? So keep that in mind. You're also probably going to want to experiment with some white noise, like some shh, 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 shh kind of stuff, like way up in the top. I can see that you're starting to do it a little bit, but usually in a drum bass song, there's like four or five layers of like looped cymbal pieces with no transient. So it's just like the noise of cymbals and then white noise down lifters and then maybe a little bit of white noise on the snare. Um, but, but, you know, I would say experiment with the noise a bit more cause the drum and bass is really, really bright. Usually, even though it's drum and bass, a lot of the time it's drum and really bright highs. So, um, you, you're probably going to like, if you were to compare this to other drum and bass songs, like in a set, you're probably going to be like, where's the highs? Why isn't this working? So... You probably don't need that transient on your hi-hats too. Like a lot of the time in drum and bass, the hi-hats have very little transient. And then that way you can get away with like faster hi-hats and more hi-hats and have them be running a little more without them getting distracted. And then the um, tambourine from Think About It by Lynn Collins uh, has these spikes at 11 and 9K, right? It's probably some in the... 
Uh, this is like glue and a break beat. Yeah, here we are. Yeah, let's see. If it... Yeah, those spikes. So a lot of my drum bass tracks, I'll have just like tiny pieces of the Think tambourine up there. A lot of people do that. It's not unusual. Yeah, there you go. You can see them. See, 9K and 11K. And that kind of like will glue a drum and bass beat together. So don't just rely on hi-hats up there. You'll probably want to get some white noise with resonant EQ peaks at 9 and 11, or maybe just have some other samples that are up there. Um, yeah, and then your your kick should probably be a little shorter. I usually, as a general rule, try to make my kicks like um, around 1 16th note long for whatever uh, BPM you're at. Okay, so we got a lot to go through today. I mean, there's definitely a lot more that I'd like to go into there, but uh, I got to make sure that we don't leave anybody hanging. This is cool. I like the micro timing and the beat. Nice. Yeah, lots of love. And you see how Rio's using these like really quiet sounds, like the hi hat. There's these like intense hi hats that would be way too much if they were loud, but because they've been mixed quietly, it's creating a nice sense of scale and energy at the same time by having those hi hats be quiet. Like, listen. They're pretty quiet. This is cool. I like how far away everything is. That main acid lead could probably come up. Yeah, all that noisy texture stuff up top is getting in the way of the acid lead. I'd say probably turn down the noise layer up at the top and then get the um, get the acid a little louder. That reverse is um, way brighter and louder than anything else up there. But um, but yeah, those those like all those highs and stuff that you have here, you need to turn them way down. Like you've been working on this mix a long time and you're not noticing how loud they are. But they're they're like it's hard to tell what's going on with the vocal because all I can hear is just these like really really loud um, noise layers hitting whatever master distortion you have. <laughs> This is a problem too, you want to get more of that bass. Yeah, the um, addition of the vocal tones to those pads is nice. Um, but yeah, I would say like you want the pads to feel like they're in the front and not the noise layers. Like those noise layers, I try to think of them as like ninja sounds, you know, they're like doing their role without getting in the way. Because like I can hear this super loud, even though it's really quiet, just because of the nature of what it is. That riser is also very loud.
Yeah, like this is still more noticeable than this because of the Fletcher Bunsen curve. Like this is very, very noticeable up here. Nice instability in the pitch there. Yeah, I'd say definitely bring those highs, like all those noise layers down, and then maybe break them up rhythmically. Like if you have some spots where they have kind of like a side chain or some gating or some little mutes where you're like muting all the highs. I like to put everything that needs spot mutes onto a um onto uh the crossfader and then i'll use the ableton crossfader to mute everything at once um but yeah having some strategic mutes and stuff up there would help but yeah you're leveling like your the sounds that are like the actual tonal parts of the lead like the acid sound and the tonal parts of the pads those need to come up and then all those noise layers need to come down like substantially um but yeah pretty cool real okay so ego you know, I should really be going quicker because we're only we're almost already at almost an hour. Um, so I'm gonna try and start moving a little quicker here. All right, ego, heart of the forest. Here we go. This is cool. Maybe a bit bright for the tabla sound. The tone is really nice though. The tone and fidelity are really nice in this part. That part's really cool. Really cool uh, sound effects there. Yeah, same thing here that the texture layers are kind of like overwhelming the rest of the sounds. Um, so I would say either like break them up a bit with some mutes, um, gain them down and level a bit. Cause like, it's hard for the main stuff to feel like it's in the front when there's really wide, bright, um, all the way, like, like when you have wide, dry highs, that's like the bane of the front of your mix. Wide, dry highs are like everybody's problem. Like those super sound designy bass sounds, you kind of want to get the other shit out of the way when those happen and then not have them happening the whole time. Because when there's just these like super wide, dry highs that are just kind of constant, it doesn't matter how much other shit there is that's happening. It's kind of like, it just feels like you're just constantly supposed to pay attention to these wide, dry highs that are happening. Yeah, the neuros are very cool. Don't get me wrong. It's just that like compositionally and mix wise, they're kind of, it's in the way of the rest of the stuff. So I would say like, if you're going to do, like, there's a reason why neuro songs have such short, minimalistic percussion sounds and tend to not have other sounds when those big neuro bases are happening. Like that's not just because all neuro producers are uncreative or something, or they're following a formula and they're boring and somebody needs to reinvent that formula. 
like that it's because that's just how sound perception works you know Yeah, like if you broke up your section so you have like a neuro bass sample section where it's like there's less of the tabla sound, there's less of the sitar sound, there's less of those constant percussions. It's just like kick, snare, sub, and like neuro sound processing. That section will feel like a drop. And then if you have the neuro bass sounds go away and then all the lush melodic sounds and tabla come back in, you'll be like, whoa, these are two different sections. This song is like twisting and turning and stuff. And it'll, it'll feel like, you know, each thing has its own place rather than everybody going all the time. And then don't be afraid too in those later sections when you want the melody to have the front, like just put a little tiny low pass on those neuro sounds so that they don't have much above like 8K and then the rest of those melodies will come to the front. Um, all right, cool. All right, we got Synthient up next. But yeah, very cool. Uh, Ego, that was uh, nice work. There's a lot to like about that song, you know? And I mean, keep in mind too, like I'm telling you this stuff like my goal with these sessions is to tell you the stuff that your friends aren't going to tell you because like if your friend comes up to you and they're like, Hey, is this song cool? The correct answer is yes, it's cool. Like they're your friend. Your job is to be supportive of them and be nice and nurture their dream. And you know, whereas like, you know, the point of getting feedback from someone who's like, you know, going to give you feedback that your friend, like the point of getting feedback in a forum like this is because I'm going to, pick your tracks apart like in a way pickier way than your friends would and be honest and blunt and all that i mean i you know i fully support all of you and i want you all to be awesome and uh i think it's great that you've chosen to spend your time making music and even if i have any like nitpicking things i'm saying these things because i'm like trying to help you i'm not like um oh, i'm so cool my music is so cool you know like i'm, I'm trying to help you so i am going to tend towards focusing on what is not working in these songs or what could be improved, but that's just kind of like the nature of what we're doing here. So uh, please understand that um, I really dig all of all of you for doing this. You know, it's really cool. And I fully support what you're doing. And, um, you know, I think you should keep going, keep getting better and better and making, uh, making cool music with all these cool tools that, that we keep getting access to. It's so crazy music production technology now. It's a, a miracle. It's one of the, one of the great things in our not so great world. So, uh, please, you know, don't, don't let any of this negative feedback bum you out. These are constructive criticisms. I'm not saying you suck. I'm not saying your music sucks. I'm saying these are some things that I noticed that you could maybe investigate. It may be fruitful, or you may decide to ignore everything I say, and that's okay too, you know? Oh, this is already really nice fidelity. Yeah, really clean and clear right off the bat. Oh, oh man, man. Nice separation of sounds. What's that thing called when you, when you meet somebody? I'm hearing I'm hearing warping artifacts on that vocal yeah okay so he's doing a lot of things really right um right away but um I want you to focus on how minimal the composition is how different from each other the songs are and how he's using negative space, i.e., you know, lack of clutter to draw attention to what works about the sounds. Because a lot of you with um, these more complex compositions, you're doing crazy cool, intricate sound design work, but we can't appreciate that sound design work without the negative space to allow us to appreciate the detail that you've put into your sound design. So like, if you want to have complex sound design, have a minimalist composition, 
If you want to have a complex composition, have minimalist sound design. But if everything is complex all the time, if everything is maximized all the time, there's no contrast and there's no structure, and then it becomes hard to appreciate what's actually going on. So, um, you know, Cynthia here, he's not over-processed his sounds. He's not putting unnecessary EQ and compression on everything because he watched some tutorial that says he should, and he's not ramming a million MIDI notes and a million channels in there so that you can be like, oh, wow, he's so skilled. You know, it, restraint is the ultimate flex. Restraint is the ultimate flex. This is awesome. Notice how he's not got fucking tons of transients on everything too. Like a lot of these drum sounds have almost no transient, you know, and that's what, that's what makes them not overbearing. Okay, I'm losing the snare in the mix a little bit here. I will often sidechain my sub to a snare um, and then um, uh, probably level that thing up a bit. And you may want to play with the frequency shifter and see if you can get the um, see if you can get the fundamental on it lining up in a spot where there's less stuff going on. But that big full frequency bass sound is just eating the snare. <laughs> Also, some of your texture sounds have not had the highs taken out of them, and there's occasionally one or two that are like much brighter and drier and louder than the rest. You'll probably want to get those uh, leveled down a little bit and maybe low passed a bit so that your main synth leads will feel like they're in front of those sounds. Yeah, especially the reverses and like some of those little chattery Foley noises in that fill. Yeah, it's eating the vocals getting eaten in there a little bit too. And I'm also hearing some warping artifacts on the vocal that you may want to investigate. The next minute you're on the other end, you're not quite sure how you got there, but you know somehow, some way you, you travel through the sound and, and you did some twisting some turns and, and, and next thing you know you're upside down and oh man, what's that called again? Whatever it is, I like it. I like it a lot. That vocal could probably come up a bit, and if you lead into it with a reverse reverb, it would be like a heartbreaker. Can you see me yeah, this is really excellent. Really great work. Really great work. I'm super impressed. I'm super impressed. Nice one, Cynthia. Everybody go follow Cynthia. Cynthia has got it going on. All right, here we go. Next up, uh, we have Gordon. Here we be.
those highs could probably come off of the symbols and stuff because everything else has this kind of cool lo-fi thing going and then there's these super dry like right off the shelf symbol noises There's a little bit of a clash between some of the chords that are in one of the instrumental samples and some of the notes that are in the lead. Yeah, some of these are like in different keys. That can occasionally be resolved with low pass or high pass filter to kind of avoid the clashy parts of the sample. Um, but you can also resolve that by just having less melodic samples at once. Are set. I'm also wanting some sub beyond the kick. Um, here's a cool thing that you should know about. There's this plugin in the Melda suite that I particularly like. God, I wish you could just not have Apple's music app and how it like forces you to always like. It's like, I want to be in charge. You downloaded a new file. Let me open myself and open it for you. It's like, nobody asked you for that. Apple. Um, okay, so I'm going to delete everything here. And I'll just... Okay, so like, let's say you got this bass. Okay. Let's say you got this bass sound and you want to add more bass to it. Right? There's a really cool plugin called M Bass Adore from Melda and it will synthesize new subs for something. Musicians are set. Musicians are set. Musicians are set. Musicians are set. solo just the wet. Got to kind of fine tune a little bit. Compare that to this. Musicians are set. No sub. Musicians are set. Musicians are set. Right? So I'll sometimes do that for a vocal or a bass if it doesn't have sub and I want it to have sub. Um, but you could also just like go in and um, synthesize a sub so it's going like boom, boom, boom. Boom, 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 with the 808 and have like a simplified version of that bass line. But yeah, you need something other than kick down there because you're relying just on the kick for bass. And then your main riff is a bass. It's just a bass that has no sub. So you kind of want sub to come in, um, in with the drums. Okay. Musicians are set. We'll talk about that later. Those auto pans with the highs are a lot for a accompaniment part. Be careful, kid. Yeah, too, there's, you have too many layers going here and it's really hard for me to tell what's the lead and it's really hard for anything to be the lead with all that crazy panning going on that balloon scraping noise. Yeah, way less stuff. 
way less stuff there. Definitely do the arrangement exercise a few times and with music that you like, where you like load it into the DAW in Ableton and then you generate empty MIDI clips to represent all of the sounds in that song, um, you will you know, start to learn about what kind of smart composition tricks your favorite producers are doing. Um, but most of the time it involves way less stuff. You need to do, you need about half the amount of sounds at a time in there and you need to be very clear what is the lead and what is accompaniment because your accompaniment is getting in the way of the leads and there's three or four leads at a time. So it's really hard um, as a listener to deal. But there's a lot of great sounds in that song and there's a lot to like. I like all the personality and the sampledelic style and the sam samples you found are all awesome. You just kind of like need to, need to get the rest of this stuff out of the way so that we can appreciate each of them in turn. Because remember, if you want people to appreciate a sound, you got to put it on a pedestal, like get everything out of the way. Just like think about like, you know, when the iPhone came out, it's like, imagine an iPhone ad where you want people to be impressed with the iPhone. Do you have the entire poster be filled with all the features and all the possibilities of the iPhone? Or do you have the poster be empty with just the iPhone in a void of emptiness? You know, and it's like that pedestal effect that allows us to appreciate each of the sounds in the song that allows us to appreciate the sound design in the song because a lot of a lot of you have these songs that are like that have way too much shit going on you have way too much cool shit going on it's all cool like we want to hear how cool it is but we can't hear how cool those parts are when there's so many parts at once Same thing here, like listen to the, the highs and sides. The highs and sides are way in front of that vocal. Okay, cool. Yeah, so here, same thing. Wide dry highs, too many leads at once. Where's the front? Where's the back? What am I supposed to pay attention to? Let us appreciate the cool things by getting the other shit out of the way. Same advice I gave everyone else. Let's hear the drop. This is cool. Yeah, so all those like supplemental noises, like the ninja sounds, like the risers and the little bits of texture and lasers and noise layers, all that stuff is super important, but it needs to be about 12 dB quieter. And, um, you know, you need to kind of like, um, like, cause that, that like cool kind of, um, chord bass kind of club riff that you got going on with the, uh, the donk noise is really cool. And like, I want that to have more space to breathe so that I can dance to that. But there's just all this like constant, constant highs all, with everything. All the ninja sounds are like not being very ninja. Yeah, I really like the style of this, though. This is super cool. I like that it's not, like, you know, following trends. Like, if you kind of got your own style going on here. It is it is cool. But, um, but, yeah, just, like, let, you know, pick one main thing to be in focus at a time and get the rest of the stuff out of the way and uh, let, the, let the sounds take turns in the spotlight, the main sounds taking turns in the spotlight. Uh, but, yeah, really, there's definitely a lot to like about that. But yeah, similar advice to most of the other ones. All right, so we've got user 
uh, the legendary user 6256-2819. Is that your birthday, like Aphex Twin? I would be really impressed if that was your birthday. Yeah! Yeah, this is cool. You could have taken a minute and a half to get to here, though. Like, you kind of just jump us right into it. And I would say with, like, a song song like this, like, you know, take your time, man. Take your time. Yeah, I mean, same advice that I, I've given everyone else. Like, let those parts breathe a little bit more. Stop trying to flex on us. Stop trying to, like, make everything be um, amazing all the time. Everything showing off all the time. Like, let those parts breathe, you know? And if you listen to the Psy genre, like, a lot of the... A lot of those producers, they're focusing on finding something that sounds good and keeping that feeling going and letting us just like bathe in how good that sound is and when you're constantly changing everything in a way you're saying nothing that i do is good enough i'm gonna keep trying stuff here's another thing here's another thing are you impressed yet here's another thing here's another thing and it's like you have lots of stuff that is good enough that it could be just that one thing and the beat and we'd be all about it for like a minute and a half even you know but to just be like constantly throwing new stuff at us is telling us that you don't believe in the stuff that you're already doing and i believe in what you're already doing you've got great sounds in this song they're really really cool you know this song could be like like a lot of really good side tracks are like fucking 12 minutes long you know like take your time take your time you know like Isai is the opposite of ADD music. You know, good, well done size. Like it holds your attention because of the suspense and the tension and the minimalism. And then there's like enough detail there to keep you engaged. But at the same time, it's like stretching that feeling out. So it feels like it goes on forever. And that's why side parties have music 24 hours a day for like a week. Right. <laughs> Cause it's never enough. Right. So, um, you know, when you're composing, compose like it's never enough. You know, you're composing like it's, you know, you, or you're composing, compose like, you know, the audience can never get enough. Right. You're composing like, that's enough of that. That's enough of that. That's enough of that. And it's kind of like undermining the size style that you have going. Cause a lot of these sounds are fucking awesome. Oh, um, speaking of producer training. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention very important announcement. Our most popular course at Producer Dojo is called the Producer's Path. And it is a 12 level course for producers everywhere from beginner to super advanced. And it is a really complete course that is designed to get you making music that you love and are happy to share in 90 days. And the people who have taken this course huge gains huge gains um the reviews from all of the members have been awesome and uh the only thing that i think could be done to improve it is doing it in real time as a group like we just did for uh remix your life so the producer's path 2.0 is going to be um i'm going to basically use the same format that i did for the remix your life course which is like super super nice um uh, lecture slides for everything and like, you know, edited tight videos, really, really organized and clean. And, uh, if you want, we're doing an early bird discount. So if you email support at producer dojo.com, S U P P O R T at producer dojo.com. Um, then we have a discount 
for early bird signups. And um, there's some extra material that you get when you sign up early. And that will give you, you know, a lot more time to go through. Because there's this uh, portion in the course that I call week zero. That's basically like a reference library. And then also like uh, the first assignment, the week zero assignment is about like getting your library together, getting your computer working properly, getting organized with your sounds, etc. And Having a little extra time for week zero is definitely going to make it um, a lot easier uh, for you in the rest of the course. Um, and then Producers Path 1.0 is not going to be um, available to everyone who gets the Producers Path 2.0 because a big part of the 2.0 thing is like streamlining it and making it cleaner, teaching all of the same concepts, but in a more uh, streamlined and focused way because not everybody wants to watch like three hours of videos for certain levels right because there's certain levels where people were like oh you know I, I feel like if you went into the stuff that i know is in the library and added this that and this like those would be nice reference videos to have but um after fielding a lot of requests from the community there's a couple of the weeks that have like three or four videos and i want each week to have one video so it's clean and simple um so when producer's path goes on sale at the full price which will be very soon um that is not going to include the full depth of the reference library that the uh current producer's path 1.0 has uh because there is lots of extra detail on everything if you want it um but people who get the early bird and uh people who have producer's path 1.0 already those people are going to get the extra detail. So um, support at producerdojo.com and uh, just make sure that you let them know that it is for the producer's path. Um, but I'm really excited to do it. Um, the Remix Your Life course came out great. And after seeing the results um, of people doing it in real time, I'm like, yo, I, we got to do all of our courses in real time because uh, we're trying to not do as much subscription stuff because a lot of people really don't like subscriptions, myself included. Anytime something has a subscription, I'm like, that's the last thing I need is another five for subscriptions that I've forgotten about that are just like there being wasted. So um, we're making these courses like courses that you get to keep for the rest of your life. And also... Um, you know, they have enough depth that you can keep returning to them. Uh, and one of the things that provides that additional depth is the reference library. So, um, so yeah, but yeah, check out uh, support at producerdojo.com. And really the only, the only thing that I really felt that I was like, we got to redo the producer's path is um, because it's not a subscription product. There were some people that would like do a couple weeks and then take a big long break and do another couple of weeks and take a big long break. And if you want to get like the full effect, it really is designed to do 90 days in real time. So um, yeah, we're going to be doing it together in, in real time as a group. And there's a habit tracker and a scoreboard for habit tracking. And uh, there may be some prizes, um, but yeah, it's going to be really fun. It's going to be really fun. Ask anyone who did it. Uh, it is super fun. So yeah, if you want to get a discount, support at producerdojo.com. All right, back to track feedback. A fun tri trick to try with Psy is like when you introduce each new layer, right? You want it to be full frequency, like going all the way high, all the way wide, etc. So you're like, whoa, there's that new thing that's cool. But if it's keeping going at the full volume with the full brightness and the full width, then there's often not room for other stuff. So if you have it come in full volume and everything that first few times you hear it and then over the course of like 16 bars or whatever, you can do like the drop rack trick where you're bringing the sides in a little, you're bringing the highs down a little, you're bringing the volume down a little and you just creep it down super slowly over like 16 bars. Then when the next thing comes in, that next thing will feel all the way bright, all the way wide, all the way in the front. And then over 16 bars, it slowly decreases too. 
right? So that's a really good trick to make space in a size style arrangement is like have things come in fully bright and fully wide, fully transient, fully open, like maximize all five dimensions. And then as 16 bars progresses, you just creep it down and creep it down and make it smaller and farther away and smaller and farther away. And that way each new thing it's like in the front and then it's slowly creeping and then there's the next new thing and then it's slowly creeping away and then there's the next new thing. It really helps. Hi-hats are a little bright and dry here. They don't really need to be that loud. And This is really cool. Yeah, there's a lot going on that I really like in this. Um, I would say some good references for you are a lot of the, the old Matsuri records. Um, like if you check out like Jujuka. Um, yeah, Jujuka. These guys, that's uh, Siyoshi Suzuki, an old Siyoshi Suzuki alias that was really cool. Jujuka and like um, Digitalis um a lot of their a lot of their stuff is really cool that um is in a kind of breakbeat psi sort of um uh breakbeat psi kind of a uh, paradigm uh kiwa is also pretty good um yeah kiwa music producer from finland yeah who does like kind of breakbeaty psi type music that is pretty cool um, but yeah, so checking out like some of the ways that those producers are blending those genres in, I think would be good reference material for you. And then, yeah. And then just really like pace yourself, you know, pace yourself, focus on stretching it out, like get something that is so good that we want to hear it all day. And then just like stretch it out, stretch the feeling out forever. You know, don't, don't be in a rush with Psy. Okay. Evolve up next. Yeah. Feel like I'm falling far behind. It's my favorite way to hide from the pain inside my mind. Why is life so hard? My dreams are too far away. Maybe I am not good enough. Stop. This is not right. Don't believe that lie. I will not play the victim. Oh, life will happen bad. Not always the plan, but I'll this is cool. This is awesome.
whatever's happening The good and bad, it's all a gift to me When I let go of trying to control Dude, wow! I'm I'm super impressed by this song. Like, they're um, I'm, yeah, really, really impressed. Like, the mixing is pretty great. Um, the lyrics and stuff are good. Like, it's all very competently handled. All the instruments are nice and fidelity sounding still. Um, recordings and mixing, pretty much everything about it is solid. Um, there's a couple leveling things. Like, for example, the swell in the end. Like there's a couple of sounds that don't happen that often that I feel like because they haven't happened that often, they just haven't had the focus of some of the other sounds, but like check out how much louder the swell is than the vocal in this end part. Right? Like, see, like, that'll get in front of the vocal. Um, the the vocal overall could probably come up a bit and um, potentially get a little bit of TLC in terms of the, the creation of the front in the mix. Uh, a really good trick for pop vocals is to get that, like, because with pop vocals, you want to get that, like air on the top of the vocal and get those like highs so that the vocal always has the front of the highs and the front of the side highs especially and a great way to do that is to layer in really really quiet like whispering all the lyrics with really tight precision making sure that they're exactly on the beat getting them to be exactly matching up with the other ones so that you don't notice them and like the fact that it's like a ASMR type vocal, if you line it up like exactly with the thing that it's on top of, you don't notice that it's whispering, but it just makes the vocal come to the front in this really cool way. So experimenting with that may be a good idea. And if you want to line things up super precisely, there's this thing called vocal line that is fucking expensive but it's basically like auto-tune for timing and when i'm we're, like i cannot imagine producing a pop vocal without this like i'm always um i'm always using it but basically you layer up um you can like make one of the vocals be the master uh like leader vocal and then you can run it on the other ones to okay cool so yeah you use vocal line so yeah so if you uh evolve if you use the vocal line with like the like whispering and you get two exactly perfect whisper takes for the left and the right and then another whisper take for the middle and then you vocal line them so that they're like exact with the main vocal and then turn them way the fuck down then you can get this really natural like dry wide high on the vocal that feels like it's just part of the vocal and like you never notice that they're separate layers if you vocal line them you know and then you can get like you want the dynamics to match the timing to match and you just get like three of them like that but yeah and then get them really really precise um that can give a lot of uh you know body to a vocal um i also have this rack that i call the dirty tap which um i don't know if you took remix your life but check out the dirty tap um i do that trick on everything but basically where you have um it's like a tap delay but using a guitar amp instead of a tap delay and then putting the dry signal late instead of the wet signal late and then you're hearing this like dry amped version of the vocal very quiet and it's like a couple milliseconds in front of the dry 
that dirty tap trick will really get a vocal to come to life. Um, LA2A on the vocal always helps to get those highs. Uh, Distressor is always good for the highs too. Um, and even just running shit out through a preamp and back and cranking the highs on like an actual analog EQ and then getting the distortion from that um, will help boost the highs. Um, because you don't want it to sound all multi-banded to fuck or else it'll like lose its front feeling, you know? So, um, yeah. And then running, running a vocal through a guitar amp and then layering like an actual physical guitar amp version of a vocal in quietly with the vocal can help get it that uh, body, especially like saturator. Like if the vocal's getting brittle from all the enhancements that you're doing on the highs, if you run the vocal into like a saturator, you can get those tubby mids and then layer that in. Just be very careful with phase correction uh, when you have that many layers. But if you use something like vocal line and you go in and you're just like being careful not to have out of phase takes, um, then that can really make it bigger. But like with music like that, like you want this vocal to be like radio pop, like in front of everything. Um, and then I think having a couple moments of like production flair would be a good idea. Um, you know, like the, the midnight EQ three preset is really good. Like if you have like a telephone vocal right before the drop or the telephone vocal effect on the master right before the drop, um, can really help. Uh, I would definitely be paying close attention to what 100 Gex are doing right now. Um, and just that whole movement. Cause to me, that's like, you know, oops, that's like some, ah. That's some of the freshest shit I've heard in a long time is that new 100 Gex album. Like their older stuff is good as also, but the new 100 Gex album is like like in the stratosphere. Uh, but check out uh, 100 Gex, check out the underscores album Fishmonger. Um, so 100 Gex, the album is I think 10,000 Gex. Um, so get that album. That album is like really next level. And then um, underscores uh, Fishmonger is another really, really good album. But there's this kind of like indie punk electronic kind of crossover thing. It's kind of like post hyper pop, I guess, or something. I don't know. But it's fucking really fresh. And hearing the way people are bringing some of the more production type elements into uh into you know guitar singing drums music is very cool uh but yeah excellent work evolve excellent excellent work um i think getting your branding visually a little bit more on point because this like i don't know what kind of music this is from looking at your page like are you gonna is this gonna be ambient music is this gonna be dubstep like I have no fucking idea, you know? So um, I would say definitely like, you know, tell us, tell us who you are visually, not just, um, not just with audio, but yeah, excellent work. Really impressed. All right. So up next we got Dookie Shoes. Oh yeah. Oh, I already like how stupid this is. This is my kind of shit. Whoa. It's very out of phase though. Look at that. Yeah, one of the ears um, on your bass sound is pretty much exactly out of phase with the other side, which means that if you force this to mono, it will disappear. And a lot of club sound systems are mono. A lot of Bluetooth speakers are mono. Your music will be listened to in mono, whether you like it or not, and you want it to sound as intended. So you're probably going to want to flip one of the sides on... Um, your bass sound or whatever, like figure out what's making it out of phase because, you know, there's like, I don't give a fuck punk rock, but there's also like, you kind of want your music to sound the way it's designed to sound, right? Bye. <laughs> 
I think you should probably get some more like random stuff in here um, and like give us a break from some of the sounds that are constant. Like a lot of the sounds are really, um, they're really constant and it's like starting to not feel like punk anymore and not feel random. Right. It's like, um, and like really, like a really good thing to do is to like, like, let's say you get, um, um, let's see, you get a Pella. If I have an acapella in here. Um, so like, let's see, I'll see if I can get an acapella. Yeah, so if you get like a vocal, right, and then warp it and make it go like really fast. Right, so you get like, and then um, get like a pedal or something, like some kind of guitar amp sim effect. Right, you get something like that where it's just like super fast for a second. And then you get like a reverb throw at the end. All right, so it's like, so then you just be like, bow, 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 distorted noise, distorted noise. And then um, you have like a reverb freeze at the end. Oh, why is that being like that? Oh, hang on. I got to get the one knob reverb freeze. There we go. Delete that automation. And then you get something like. <laughs> right. And then especially if you get like a. Get like a beat repeat after it. And then just like cut it. See so it like. Then you could have it just like it'd be like, bah, 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 bah. I don't give a fuck. Here's punk rock bass noises. And then suddenly that stops. There's like maybe a, a record scratch effect or like a needle scratch. Maybe that'll do it. Okay. Um... Get like a needle scratch kind of sound. And you can kind of make a accidental needle scratch noise sometimes pretty easily just by running things into distortion again and again. But yeah, if you get like a needle scratch. Yeah, so you get something like. And then, um, let's see if I have any gabber samples. I think I have gabber samples. Yeah, also get gabber samples. Like, go, and just go sample a bunch of gabber records. Like, you don't actually have to. That is not a gabber kick. These are not nearly distorted enough. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you want to make gabber sounds, take a a kick drum, and then we're gonna do that's gonna be that long. Yeah, let's do that. Get like a guitar amp sim. Okay, now let's make this fast. Right, so you get something like that. And then uh, Gabber is fun because you can also, when you do something like this, if you go to the envelopes here and you unlink the envelope. So I'm gonna go on the clip, I'm gonna go to transposition, unlink the envelope, and then make this really long, right? So then you can have it be like normal for bar, 
and then ramp up like some semitons. Oh yeah, you know. Um, but yeah, it's like if you just get guitar amps, put guitar amps on fucking everything, uh, but especially vocals, and then guitar amp on a fucked up vocal with a reverb throw after it, and you're stoked. Um, some good references for you would be like Murs Bow, uh, The Boredoms, uh, Lenny D, uh, Rob G, um, Hellfish and Producer. Hellfish and Producer especially are so they're so sick. Um, and then like uh, of course um, Death Grips. Uh, and then Venetian snares, um, Duran, 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 aka Jason Forrest, um, um, Shit Mat, Knife Hand Chop, um, Laffo, all very good punk rock kind of I don't give a fuck electronic music and then like why are you using standard tuning fuck with the auto fuck with the um, micro tuner you know, get things in weird other scales, you know, like, uh, uh, check out, um, what's his name? Sevish. He does really cool, like alternate tuning system music. So definitely check some of that shit out. Um, and yeah, break more rules. You know, if you're going to break rules, fucking break them, you know, break more rules. All right. Rhymetry, you are last, but not least, Rhymetry is fucking sick. If you're not following Rhymetry, what are you doing with your life? Oh, this is good. I feel like I drank a green juice smoothie.
I think you need to give that sitar a break in the middle of the song so that we can really appreciate those cool bass sounds and like all the slippery underwater shit and stuff, you know, like that's uh, the because every time that sitar comes in is just like super chillsville. Like I feel like my my neck is like a noodle. Um, so you know, having some bits where it's like, that's out of there. And then like, you know, you're really kind of getting down with all the subs and cool fills and sound design. And then when it comes back, you're like, ah, my neck can become a noodle again after all that headbanging. Um, but yeah, it's just like, it gets a little bit constant. And then, uh, there were some really cool bits where you had the bass follow the, like, you know like little uh pickup melody that like brings you into the next bar break those were pretty cool you know and having everything go like like that kind of um that kind of like those moments where all these parts that have like disparate riffs come together and play in a unison effect um, that's one of the things that I really like about like Tipper, for example, you know, Tipper's tracks, he'll have these moments where everything is apart and you're in this psychedelic soup and there's these like neon fish cyborg fucking noises flying around. And then suddenly everything's like super clean and it's like, and then it splatters and turns into a million separate sounds again. Um, you were like kind of doing that in one spot. And I think you should like lean into that, you know, and especially like if you're trying to make a big transition, if you have it do that unison thing and then loop and then loop again, you're like, oh shit, what's going to happen? And then every one of those big fills and then the drop, you'll be like, oh, what a great transition. This track is so dynamic and it's going all over the place. Whereas right now it's like, you know, those moments are kind of getting overshadowed by like just being constantly back to the groove. And there's definitely things to be said for like staying in a dance groove pocket when you've got one going. But this track is like, it's like three minutes long of, of the same steady dance groove. So I think you could have like a couple really exaggerated unison type buildups in it. Um, and then also like, um, you, I feel like some of those really psychedelic like downlifters would really help like at the beginning of the phrases if you have some sound here where it goes like like takes a really long time to melt and morph um those can be really effective at the starts of your phrases in a more kind of like psychedelic paradigm you know and uh i think in this this particular um, this particular track could benefit from that, especially if you're looking for a sound to come into the pain zone and the high highs and the sides when the sitar sound goes away and there's a bass drop. That downlifter noise could be just the thing to lead you into a bass drop where the uh, sitar noise goes away and then the bass kind of takes over. Because you've got all these like super cool fills and like sound designy things happening, but the, it's just a constant horizontal energy of that sitar that's making it sound like the song doesn't have as many dynamic cool changes as it does. So, um, but yeah, I think if you can figure out ways to make that go away for longer and then get reintroduced, that may also give you some space to like, you know, maybe you do like a funky gated version of that riff where it's just holding one note and the sitar noise is going like and like going to some like panning edit of the sitar noise where it's operating in more of like a drop version of that sound could be cool too um but you know when i think of like sitar kind of opium den vibes like that i'm like I'm like relaxing and turning into a wiggly noodle person, you know? So having some moments where you're like exiting that dynamic and being like, okay, now it's time to go hard. Now it's time to put your hands in the air. Now it's time to shake your ass. Like, you know, dance music should read like dance instructions. And I think like for the gigs that I know you are into, you're probably going to want to be able to be like, yo, this 
is why you bought concert tickets right now. Like here is the fucking payoff, baby. So, um, yeah, I think that this track is very close to that. And I'd also like, I would love to see you kind of like find a way to have like, just like a turnaround vocal in this one or like some other way to use your voice because like you chose the name Rhymetry, son. Like, you know, that's, that's your name. You chose it for like it or not. That is your artist brand. Buy the ticket, take the ride, you know? So having some way to use your vocals that, you know, I'm not saying this song needs to be like a rap song with you fucking telling us how it is for the whole song with no breaks, but having a paradigm where you could be like doing, um, you know, maybe just a turnaround vocal or like some heavily affected ad libs. So like, it doesn't necessarily have to be a vocals track and like some of the tracks, some of the sounds could be more affected to the point where it's just like, it's not even really a vocal. It's just like an instrument, but you know, you've chosen the name Rhymetry and I kind of feel like if you're going to pick that name, you should have ways to work your voice in that are maybe not like writing pop songs every time by using a bit more of your voice in terms of like a sound design element or like in terms of just branding without, uh, without more of a song or whatever. So, so yeah. Um, but yeah, really cool, really cool. Great work from everybody. Uh, I'm super pumped. I'm glad I, uh, took the time to do this. Uh, this is fun. Uh, hopefully the Gwen Stefani one doesn't get our channel in copyright trouble. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think we, we, I don't know. We'll see if we have to do a, a no, no bootlegs version. Oh, you have, YouTube are so picky about it. Well, yeah, we'll see if they leave it up. If they leave it up and stuff, I'm down to do probably more of these, um, uh, more of these streams and do track feedback again. I think we have another track feedback link. Uh, if you sent in for feedback last time, you'll get the link and, uh, I'm sure the link will be in the video description if you're watching this when it's not live. Um, but yeah, lots of love. That was really fun hanging out and hearing all your cool music. And then, um, yeah, don't forget very, for very limited time, you can get a discount and, you know, extra bonuses. If you want to sign up for the producer's path next month, it starts in May. And, uh, yeah, it's super worth it. It's a 90 day course that will have you making music that you are super proud of. And, uh, it's a lot of fun and, uh, doing it in real time with a group of people will make you do all of the 12 levels in 90 days. And if you do all of the 12 levels in 90 days, it's like building a machine. Like it works every time when you make it to the end. So uh, doing it in 90 days with a group with habit tracking and a scoreboard, I think that's uh, could be just the thing you need to stay motivated and do all 12 in the 90 days. So yeah, come party with us. If you want to get that early bird bonus, support at producerdojo.com. I'm not sure when that ends. Depends on how mobbed it gets. It's a limited capacity course, of course, because it's real time with the group. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in the producer's path. And if you want to know more about the producer's path, theproducerspath.com. And uh, if you're ready to get that early bird bonus, support at producerdojo.com. All right. Lots of love. Thanks for choosing to spend your time here hanging out today. Peace out.